Welcome everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, I uh, wanted to let you know we're going to do what we always do. We always pray for another church here in town. That's a really big deal to us. And today we're going to pray for a very good friend of mine, Dave Reynolds, who's the pastor over at Hope Community Church. So uh, if you're the praying type, join me and we're going to pray for them today before we uh, dive into what we have. God, thanks for this afternoon, Lord. Thank you for uh, the gift of this family. Thank you for the chance uh, to meet freely and openly as we do. And Lord, we're thankful today for our brothers and sisters at Hope Community Church, God. Thanks for Dave and Marcia and what they've meant to this community. And uh, God, I just pray that all of those that meet there will experience your presence and we'll all grow closer to each other as uh, we're drawn close to you. Lord, we also pray today as we open up your scriptures and also as we have conversations, God, that you be very present in this place. Let us be aware of your presence. We know it's here. And uh, pray for a sweet time with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, I'm thankful for Brian and Debbie, uh, Kyle and Greta, and, and actually all the towers the band is uh, playing a show in San Diego right now, which is pretty great. I also got to hear, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but I'm going to because I, I feel so powerful. But I got to hear a free release of a song that Towers put together this week that you'll be hearing shortly in the next month or so, and it will blow your mind. Take it to the next level. Hey, Ben, can you turn me up just a little bit? I want to hear a minute. I want to be yelling. Thank you. Um, here's the deal. I was in Phoenix. I just got back. So I've been kind of a little, a little bit scattered brain, running around all over the place. I had uh, three of my four children were in the uh, Kick for the Cure soccer tournament down in Phoenix. And uh, we were very fortunate because that tournament is huge. It's uh, all over Phoenix. Thanks, Ben. That's good. And uh, it, it, it's all over. We got really lucky because my three kids on three different teams ended up at the same complex. So basically, for the last two days, Mark and I were just kind of taking turns, switching halves between kids, going over. All three kids had four games, and it was just madness. Uh, but we made it, and we're back. And my kids almost won zero games. They're pretty, pretty, pretty rough go. Sierra actually did pull out a victory uh, this morning, which was pretty great because they played a horrific team. And that was uh, the only reason. Not that they're not good on their own court. I got to do this, though. I, in fact, most of my family is all split up, coming back up from the valley in different cars and that kind of thing. So I'm a little bit nervous with the roads and whatever. But I got to drive Blaze back, which is really fun because Blaze and I have actually got to hang out. Blaze is my four-year-old, and uh, I get to hang out with him more than the others because he's not full-time in school yet. Sometimes he goes to preschool, but if I have a free enough day, I just bring him to my meetings and hang out with him all the time. And the reason I bring that up is because Blaze is at a, the age where four-year-olds just ask really great questions. And that's kind of what we're in the middle of. I'll kind of jump right to what we're going to be talking about. If you were here last week, you know we're kind of in the middle of a different kind of thing. We're having this Thanksgiving conversation all month long. We tried it last week and it went good enough that we're going to give it another run here. And, uh, you guys did a great job. It would be me on the other end. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about things that we're thankful for in kind of an open question forum. Not like we do in the past. In the past, we'll send in text messages and I go in the back and I get them from anonymous sources and then I Google it, as we said, I come out here and I give you the answer. But this time, we're gonna be more like a classroom. This is an auditorium, it's a classroom, and you're gonna be bold and throw your hand up there and ask questions here in a little bit. And we're gonna talk, but what we're gonna talk about, Blaze has already got me prepared for, because he's been asking me questions all week. I love it, he was, uh, I, and I also have this fear, I don't know if I should admit this or not, but being a pastor, I am hyper terrified of having uh, PKs, pastor kids. No offense if that's you. But I'm sure your life is miserable, and uh, so I, I don't. I don't. I try really, really hard not to force God on my kids at all. Now, I love talking about God when they want to talk about God, and we pray at dinner, and I pray for them at night. So I guess we're pretty much forcing religion on them. But I don't ever. I really try not to ever, ever have a conversation that's not really, really natural. Blaze has just been asking me questions like crazy driving around town. And so he, we're driving the other day, and he goes, "Hey, Dad." And he's in the far back seat, so it's always kind of hard for us to communicate with just me and him. I feel like a chauffeur. And, and he's like, hey, hey, Dad. And he goes, did, did God make himself? He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Blaze, actually, you know, he, he's, he's always been there. God's eternal. And he just sat there for a minute, and he went, God's a turtle? <laughs> I was like, this might not be the right <laughs> age. Right? Like, we're, not gonna, we're probably not going to hammer this one out. It's not going to get done. I said, no, well, I mean, I, I mean, maybe it's a turtle, I don't know. So maybe, maybe that's better for you. Just think of the coolest ninja turtle you can think of. That's but, he, uh, but then he kept asking questions, and he, and he got accidentally deep. He didn't mean to be, but he was like, well, you, he's like, we can't see God, right? He's invisible. I was like, yeah, that's true. And I was like, well, you know, let's just not go too into it. You know? I was like, but yeah, pretty much he's invisible. And he goes, but he goes, what about a shadow? Could you see a shadow? And I was like, well, no, probably not in the way you're asking. 
but you just gave me the best intro for church this Sunday. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> because actually, when we think about nature, what we're going to be talking about today is nature, because if you don't know this about me, and probably a lot of you are the same way, I am obsessed with nature. And, and the theme for our whole month is basically I'm selfishly just vomiting on you things that I'm insanely thankful for, and I want to talk about them because I'm thankful for them. And we're going to talk about nature today. Now, nature, in and of its essence, is, in a way, the shadow of God. Probably not in the sense of light being blocked and it casts a shadow, but you could even think of the great philosophers, I think it's Plato's The Cave, had the idea that there are forms of things in reality, and all we see, he had this, this whole allegory of being in a cave, and there's a firelight that's backlitting these dancers, and you see the shadows, and he said, that's kind of where we live, is in the shadows, but somewhere out in the universe and reality, there's the real form. And we're only seeing the shadows. And that went on this whole philosophical thing about what something's form or essence is. But I think there's actually something to that in the Christian world. There is something to the fact that there's an essence that we see or experience in nature that is just the shadow of the real thing. And as I often commented here, I think that's one of the reasons we experience more of an ache when we're around beauty than a fulfillment. Now, we, hopefully, we also experience fulfillment. I mean, we live in a beautiful place. And we experienced beauty. I mean, driving up from Phoenix today was spectacular. I love the drive. I love going through the different bio zones and all the different things. But the rain created this fog and these kind of silhouetted Rocky Mountains kind of up past Black Canyon City, you know, that area right there. And it was just absolutely stunning. But here's the thing. If I look for that to fill me, not going to happen. But if I see beauty, and by the way, my favorite question is why is it beautiful? And it makes me ask another question. What is the form casting the shadow? Beauty can bring us to God. Nature can bring us to God. And in that way, we can be mostly fulfilled because God is the only thing that will fill us up. I wanted to open, before we open questions, a little bit of scripture. Because since we're doing questions the whole time, we don't really dive into the Bible. But I wanted to show you that this is a really important thing to Jesus as well. This is a very famous passage. And it comes right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, which we often allude to here. Probably the most famous oration any human's given in at least in a Western context. And this is what it says in Matthew 6, 25. He says, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life. And then he says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. I always like that line because Jesus does have these weird moments where he speaks as if he actually saw Solomon in all of his splendor. There's, there's moments where he says, oh, Israel, I've longed to gather you together like a mother hen takes his chicks. It's almost like he's speaking of as God of history. He's like, I remember Solomon. He wasn't dressed as good as the flowers that we've thrown together. And I love that. Now, what's my point? My point is that Jesus was very comfortable using what we call natural theology. He looked at nature. In fact, if, what's interesting about Jesus in the incarnation is this mostly what he did. When he taught, he used parables, and he liked to talk about seeds and vineyards and vines that grow. And he talked about shepherds and sheep, and he used the natural, physical universe as a teaching point. In fact, he did that much more than actually quoting the Jewish scriptures. And sometimes when he quoted the Jewish scriptures, he was actually challenging them and getting people to think about the actual essence and nature of the universe. Now, let me, here's what's a little bit difficult about this Sunday Thanksgiving conversation thing. Here's what I want to make really clear. There's two things going on at once. I want to call us all and challenge this month to truly be thankful I want to call us to think about things that we are truly thankful because as I mentioned last week, I believe with all my heart, thankfulness is a direct pathway to God. It opens up the door. It puts us in a position of humility and thankfulness and positiveness that actually ushers us to the presence of God. I want to challenge us to do that. What's confusing is then why do we go have these questions and conversations which are kind of mostly about controversial things? And my idea is that it should be like that of a Thanksgiving table. Hopefully, when you sit around the Thanksgiving table this coming up holiday, you'll have the comfort to have real conversations, faces out of phones, family, eye-to-eye -eye conversations with people. And I hope that something you're thankful for will just gush out of who you are, and I hope that it'll start a conversation. And it might be that you're thankful for your friendships. That's going to be what we're going to be talking a little bit more about 
next week, relationships. But it might be that it's nature. It might be that it's your faith, which we talked about last week, the Christian faith in general. But hopefully it'll start conversations, and I hope they're not all smooth. I hope that some people fire back and say, look, I, I get it. This means something to you, but why should it mean something to me? And I hope that we're ready to have real loving conversations. Because here's the, the underlying theme that I want us to see and practice together in this conversation. When you're thankful for something at a very deep level, you're very secure in that thing. It's something you like to talk about. And so when I talked about last week, the most vague and broad topic, our Christian faith, and we had questions from all over the board, I hope that one thing that we can see in our conversation is something that we can be secure in, even when there's difficult questions. Because we're thankful, and it means something to us, and we can talk about it in an open, loving way, in a safe place. So that's, that's kind of my idea, is that we could have these kind of conversations about things we're thankful for. One last note before you have to start asking questions. Um, one of the things that I think is really important about this process is that we have complete freedom to be open. And, and I always ask for this grace, too, here. I, I obviously could be completely wrong about any of these things. Anytime we do open texts or this kind, it's really important for you to give me the grace to share my opinions about things. And you go, oh, you know what? I don't agree with that guy. He's an idiot. I go, great. That means you're an intellectual person. So make sure you have that freedom as we're moving forward. Now, I'm going to open up the floor, and I want you to ask questions, and I want them to be somewhat related to the natural universe. It could be about modern science, faith, relationship. It could be about the cosmos. It could be about the parables of Jesus. It could be about what's natural, unnatural. There's all sorts of things that might fall into this category. I don't want to feed questions into your mind. But I want you to keep them as much as possible within that realm, and then we'll try to get through a few of those before we run out of time. So, who's brave enough to start out? And I will... Reiterate that I am not scared to talk about today's fantasy football if nobody asks a question. <laughs> because I am winning by 40 points. Aww. Who wants to start off? Brave souls. I'll start off. Okay. Um, what do you... And it's more just like what you think about, but about... Hey, Jordan, can you tell us your name before you start? I forgot to say that part. Uh, hi, I'm Jordan. I just want to <coughs> have you talk about Fibonacci's number. And how that just connects everything in the world and how awesome it is. Okay, uh, I won't spend a lot of time on it because of my lack of knowledge. Another freedom I need to say is I don't know a lot of things. But Fibonacci's number is a, a ratio. Is this right from the Nautilus shell and all those things that ties together? Um, it is fascinating. And engineers and mathematicians have been fascinated for a long time in what seems to be an unusually uh, strong coincidence of numbers. Now, Here's what I think. I'm going, to, I'm going to use this and do kind of a little juke here to get a, to a separate topic because I don't know much about that number or why it's so incredible. I do know that people are in awe of it, and that's about the extent. Now, I'll use that as a jumping pad and get to my own agenda of something I'm thankful for <laughs> nature is that it is intelligible, that we can find the Fibonacci number. The fact that pi exists because triangles work in the way they do, we don't know when it ends. Mathematics and science are something about nature that is a uniquely, here's what I want you to hear, a uniquely theistic gift to the world. You see, if you go back in time and you rewind the clock, and you go back to the Romans and the Greeks, and you go back to the Israeli tribes and the Babylonians and the Asians, and you try to trace human history and how we understand the world, about 500, 600 years before Christ, there was a really major shift in thinking that is related to that. Because there was a big question as to whether or not the world can be known or should be known. And it actually started with people like Aristotle who started saying, and he basically didn't realize it, but he was birthing what's called the cosmological argument. There has to be a prime mover. Things are in motion. Things seem to be moving. So something had to move them at the beginning. A first cause is what he would say. And that was kind of the beginning of understanding that there was, in the Greek thinking, the idea of a god. In fact, it started to move in their thinking from multiple gods to one god that could be the god of philosophy. Fill in all the blanks that could make this sort of universe. But it was Christian specifically, especially, it's no coincidence that it was in Christian Europe that mathematics and science and the Enlightenment and the modern world birthed because Christians believed in creationism. Now, don't, don't be scared off by that word because of the modern weird American debate about it. But they believed there was a first cause, a prime mover. And they believed because of that that the world and the universe is intelligible. It means that we can look at it and we can measure novel shells. We can go, wait a minute. Why is this number the exact same year and the exact same in a spiral galaxy? What's the connection? And that's really a gift that Christians have given to science. In fact, they have always been at the forefront of science, which is a shame that there's some sort of conflict now. I hope that was a good enough juke for you, but I do also think it's fascinating. There's some beautiful things in nature like that. What else have we got? Yes? Who's the better pick in fantasy, the Cardinals defense or the Seahawks? 
I would like to plead the fifth on that because I'm afraid if I answered honestly, this room would not be pleased. <laughs> really sad. So, um, yes, the back. Um, I'm Jesse. And Hi, why Jesse. do uh, why does it seem that unbeliever or non-believers are better stewards of the earth than believers? Thank you for asking that, Jesse. This is a, a hot button and a, and a pet peeve of mine. First of all, it does seem that way. Um, I'm very hopeful that things are not that way. Um, it seems like, because we only hear the loudest believers' voices, which, by the way, are the minority of believers, that all believers just want to drill for oil and want to vote Republican or whatever. And I'm not trying to get political. I'm just saying we, we usually only hear the loudest voices. But what I have found, and what's been a really gift to me over time, is the more I know more and more pastors in town, the more time I've spent in Scotland with a huge diversity of Christians around this world, is that the quieter voices are the majority, and most Christians care deeply about ecology and care deeply about the environment. Why do they care deeply about the environment? Because that is the Christian message. You know, if you were here when we talked about what sort of truth Genesis is, one of the main gifts that Genesis is, and this was shockingly counterculture 2,000 years ago when they started to look back at the Jewish scriptures and say, what does it mean? See, back in that same tension I was talking about, is the earth good or bad or intelligible? Well, the Christian narrative says it's very clearly in this very first poem that God made the earth good, in fact, very good. And then he puts this kind of archetypical couple and the, the first humans that are, are representative of all humans in this way in this role of taking care of the earth which was central to the Jewish author of that text and central to the early Christians. Here's the problem. It isn't Christianity that has made people destroy this earth. It is greed that has made people destroy this earth. This is something Christianity should speak very strongly against. It is greedy people who will do anything for a profit that don't care if it cuts down all the rainforests in the world. It's greedy people who do whatever it takes for convenience to destroy this planet. And guess what? Christianity has always spoken very strongly and clearly against greed. And therefore, I would say that it's sad. And I actually agree with you, Jesse. It's a pet peeve that I hate that the loudest Christian voices are not doing enough to save our planet and are not recognizing the beautiful science led by Christian scientists about climate change and all those things. We have a great responsibility as Christians to care deeply about this because God said it's good. Because we are very much connected to this earth. It's the only one we got. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes. My name is Holly. Um, can you say anything about the relationship between God and psychology? Uh, maybe like the power and weaknesses of the mind and how God can use that? Absolutely. Thank you. She asked uh, if I can talk about the connection or relationship between God and psychology. You may not even know this is a controversial topic, but there's actually a, a, someone here in town who's a, a, a pastor who is vehemently against psychology. My wife is a, a counselor, and I'm a big fan of psychology. And I understand the tension. I, I want to talk a little bit about the tension and then talk about why I'm such a big fan of psychology and where I see God in it. The tension comes from the fact that Christians, especially in this country, have somewhere got into a new narrative that hasn't always matched the narrative of Christianity that the only thing that you can use to fix your life is God. Which is fine, in a sense I agree with that, but see, I think God wants us to use the good earth that he gave us. And he wants us to go see doctors and discover medicine and be on the forefront of those things. And Christians, and they are a minority who are anti-psychology, are fearful that it's just another way of secularizing and moving away and saying we don't need God. And I would say no, and here's why. Christians, and this is what I love about the Christian worldview, have always been, because of our belief that that the world is intelligible, have been at the forefront of going deeper to understand what we can learn. And the human mind is actually the, the deepest, farthest frontier that we've yet to conquer, but it's very, very exciting. And the thing is, God wants us, there's the old adage, I used to hear it, and I think it spawned out of the early 20th century, is God helps those that helps themselves. And there's this essence to like, okay, you could use that in a bad way or a good way, but there's some sort of truth to that. God wants us to be a part of the healing process. He wants us to learn and grow and discover. And what I always come back to as an astronomer, and it does relate to psychology, I always share with you guys about Kepler. And Kepler is saying that he does astronomy because he wants to think God's thoughts after him. We're just catching up to God's minds. It's not like we're out there and we're going to discover something where there's not God and we're going to give up on God. See, it's in all the things we've already discovered that we see God. This is one of my biggest pet peeves. 
One thing that drives me crazy about Christians, they make the same mistake throughout the centuries, is they get scared of science or learning or new things or open-mindedness, and they shove God into the unknown. They say, well, we don't know about this yet, so let's put God over here. We don't know about the cosmos yet, so let's put God there. What we know about here, there, there's no God in it. I'm going, you're missing the point because the best Christians like Kepler and Galileo and Brahe and name them after Newton, all of them, they looked at what we saw and they see God in it. And I see the same thing for psychology. We look at the human mind to find God in it. And what we're learning is absolutely incredible. And it's an exciting field. I know a lot, my wife knows a lot more about it than me, but I love hearing her. She's reading, a lot of you are familiar with uh, Brown's books and the things about the human mind and what we're starting to unlock and understand about epigenetics. And I see God in it. Because what we're finding out about this incredible human mind is that it is certainly more than the sum of its parts. And the human consciousness, whatever the essence of that thing is, is incredible, and at its very core, free will is a very real thing. Neural pathways, the way we correct them and move them towards addiction and reroute them and get help. I'm saying as Christians, let's look for God in psychology instead of being afraid of it. That's my, my personal thought on that. Another great question. The mind is something in nature, by the way, that I also see incredible beauty in. And I think you can't help but wonder at God and seeing that makes me comfortable. Good, good question. What else? I'm gonna watch the time closely. Yes. I completely agree with that statement. Um, we got to be careful. I, I always have to be careful with any of these topics that I would consider kind of controversial. One of the things that I often tout here in this room is how diverse this room is, which I love and I hope never changes. One of the things that I'm personally obsessed with nature about is its senseless diversity. I mean, it is ridiculous in biology, geology, pick a topic, it, 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 subject. It is senseless diversity. And I love that we have the same thing in this room. So if I start talking about human evolution, for instance, there's going to be people in this room that are going to go, yes, finally, someone's talking about this. And there's going to be other people going, I'm dying inside because this challenges everything I believe. And I'm going, hey, that's okay. Both situations are okay. Because what we share in common when we talk about Christianity is what we were talking about last week, the incarnation, the, the life and death of Christ, the resurrection, the things that are essentially the non-negotiables of Christianity. But I do care a lot about this topic of climate change and evolution because you care a lot about these topics. And we care as humans as we're learning and discovering. One thing that I would say about this tape that I think is important, and those are kind of a few different things you mentioned there. If we're going to talk about evolution, and, and I could spend the whole time talking about this, it's something I'm very passionate about, but I want to be very careful, is I want you to know that you can be a devout, Jesus-loving, Holy Spirit-filled, alive Christian who's at the forefront of studying human evolution. There's not tension there. Because Christianity has an incredible text at its beginning that is filled with truth about who created us and why he created us and what went wrong, and it has nothing about how he created us. And you're going to say, whoa, 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 yes it does. It says specifically from a rib and dust, and I'll go, you need to learn more about Jewish literature. You need to learn about Jewish parallelism. You need to learn about metaphor and allegory and understand what the original author that God inspired intended. You need to understand that it is a gift this book of Genesis, and it has nothing to do with the field of evolution. There's completely separate things, and they're both wonderful to hand in hand. In fact, there's Christians at the forefront of studying and learning about that. Same is true of climate change. We need to learn and think about it and figure out. We need to recognize it's complicated. You say climate change, and all of a sudden all the Republicans and Democrats are just going to split with their anger. I mean, I see Facebook posts. I know many people are. <laughs> I know what's going on. And listen, all we need to do is have the humility and community to say it's a big deal and we may not have it all figured out. Okay, so we can have loving conversations with people across political spectrums and say, hey, we both love Jesus. We both believe God wants this earth to be taken care of. Let's see how we can work together to figure that out. And we don't have to fight a battle about what's proven or not proven yet and those kind of things. But what you hit it on, and so did Jesse, is that Christians have a reputation, don't they? And this is the thing that I love talking about. That is not Christianity. There are a ton of Christians around this world who are highly educated and love with Jesus, who love evolution, and who love studying climate change. And by the way, the same is true on the opposite sides of those things. There are brilliant, smart Christians who I don't necessarily agree with who believe in a young earth. And they are crazy smart and have PhDs. I don't get it, but I know that they love Jesus and we're brothers in Christ, and it's cool. It's not, it's not going to separate me from and same thing with climate change. It's a diverse group. 
And the cool thing is the church is big enough to handle that kind of stuff. And we can still look at nature and say, wow, what's behind this? Great, great state. Yes? Um, my name's Sydney. Um, some Christians and like parts of scripture will claim that like, um, God loves us more than nature. And I'm like wondering your thoughts on that. Okay, thanks, Sydney. She said this, uh, some parts of scripture or some Christians would say that God loves us more than nature. And, and nature there needs to be defined a little bit because it gets a little bit trickier with life than dirt. Um, there's a spectrum, and, and Christians do have vibrant, very interesting discussions about what God loves. And doesn't. Now, God is love. That's the first thing we need to understand. God, and, and sometimes we get a little sidetracked with God loving and measured spoons and who he loves the most. And we've got to remember that God is love, according to John, who knew Jesus very, very well. And that's a really important thought to think about. But there is a difference between dirt and a mosquito and a mouse and a cat a chimpanzee and Coco who can say 3,000 words of sign language and a human. And none of us know definitively what the difference of all those things is. Life is a miracle. Life is part of nature. Life is one of those things that we wonder at. And I believe with all my heart, you asked my opinion, I want to make this very clear, this is my opinion. I think God's crazy in love with all of it. All of it. And I don't think we can even understand that. And that's very much my opinion. But I certainly see, in fact, I had to do a module at St. Andrews, which I really enjoyed, on the bioethics, basically, looking at life particularly. And one of the things that challenged me the most was animal ethics, given the way that I was raised in a particular way in a particular church and taught about what the Bible says. And to go re-look at the scriptures that uplift animal life in a shocking way. Um, and so I would just challenge you in this. I'm not going to try to convince anybody of anything. I would say if you're interested in those things... Go Google or find some scholarly articles about what Scripture has to say about animal life and how highly God thinks of it. It's part of His creation. It's pretty cool. Good, good question. Good thought. What else? Yes. Hey, I'm Chad. Hey, Chad. Can you do just a quick survey of... Is that baby asleep? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, dating systems that we use? Dating systems. Yes, but I'm going to defer a little bit... <laughs> There are two different ways to handle that. One is, who do I date in college? One of them is carbon dating or test dating. You're going for the second one, right? Okay. The, sec the, the, the first one, who do I date in college, will be a much appropriate question next week when we're talking about human relationships. This week, uh, the dating systems, yeah, that's a really, really great question. So, I was taught growing up, you got to understand, I grew up in Texas, and I was taught that the earth is young. I used to go to conferences, and they talked about how carbon-14 dating was wrong, because they dated a chicken boat at the wrong time. I used to be able to tell you all about it. But then, I, in grad school, I started thinking, I better learn about this for myself. And I started to really dive into potassium-4 and carbon-14 and uranium-238 and all the different radiocarbon dating systems, all the different layers geologically. It's a very complicated question that no one is here to hear about. You don't come to church to have a, a geology lesson. But I'm glad the question came up. And here's what I would say. It's a lot more secure than you realize. So some of the misnomers and miscommunications come from, like, let me give an example of carbon-14. That was an infamous one when I was a, a young youth group Christian guy. And it was always scientists, Christian scientists were coming and saying things like, oh, it's a terrible thing, you can't date this chicken bone. Well, you can't because it only works in a certain range. The, the radiocarbon half-life of carbon-14 only works for dating things around 50,000 years. They won't work on a chicken bone date last Thursday. But the other misconception I had is I used to always think, well, how do you know how much uranium-238 was originally there if it's cutting down in a half-life? But you've got to understand that uranium-238 changes to lead at a particular mathematical half-life. And we have over a million samples of enclosed inside crystals all over this earth of uranium-238 changing to lead at the exact same rate from volcanoes all over this planet. And when you chart them out, they all give the exact same age of the earth. And so it's pretty interesting when you learn about it. It's fascinating. And by the way, the most important piece of it in a church setting is it doesn't matter. It's not related to our faith. In fact, I would argue in terms of natural theology, when I look at an earth that's old, that took long processes, and we can see it in lots of ways, tree trunks that are far older than we can imagine, fossilized, and all these different things that we can measure, the ice cores and all their layers. It's unbelievable the amounts of things that tell us about the age of this earth, the craters on the moon. All of them tell me something about God. He's really big. And he's outside of time. And he's a God of processes. So I'm trying to do a little juke on you, Chad, and make this a little theological is that it may be that in your life, the God that you know that's crazy in love with you, he might be about slow processes just as much as he's about lightning crashes and earthquakes.
ways. Because some of us experience that in our real life, don't we? Sometimes you have an absolutely lightning experience with God and it changes everything. Some of us have a lot more of a process going on. And I go, that sounds like the God of geological time. That sounds like a God that grows trees all the time. That's a, a God that likes gestation processes for babies and animals and humans to take time to become a baby. It's a God of process, and I see natural theology even in evolution. In fact, I would argue that evolution for me is one of the most beautiful things I see about God because God creates dynamically instead of statically. See, if we thought up a God, we would think up a God like us that would build a house. Here's it. We got ourselves a static house. But God is a step ahead of us. We're trying to get on his page. He creates dynamically things that can adapt and change. And as, as our own artificial intelligence and intelligence increases, it's what we're moving towards. We're trying to create things that think on their own in software programs. We're trying to be more like God. We're just catching up to the beauty. So I even see beauty in evolution in geological time. Thanks, Chad, for that. How are we we got time to pray a couple more. Doing great. Good questions, guys. Yes. How God views it, and what is our place as Christians, like how to interact with it. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very difficult question. She asked, uh, in essence, forgive me for shortening it, but basically about mental illness in relationship to God. Uh, this is really hard. You know, my, my wife is a counselor. She works with uh, substance abuse uh, residential people right now. So this is a big part of her life. Before that, she worked with abused women and children, but also just across the mental health spectrum. And by the way, this is a very personal question for almost all of you because almost all of you know someone who's mentally, has a mental illness or you yourself have a mental illness. Let me make this very clear at the very beginning. This is the easy part. There's one easy, easy part of this question. God is crazy in love with people who have mental illness. Beyond what we can even imagine, he's in love with them. And one of the things that is challenging to me is to realize how much we don't know about who has mental illnesses and how they affect mass murderers, all sorts of things. And I go, you know what? I don't know anything about what's going on in a lot of these cases, but I know God is crazy in love with people with mental illnesses. And back to your question point, I think that God is calling us forward as stewards of this planet to learn more, to dive deeper, to go deeper into the cosmos of the mind and figure out how we can help and how we can grow. One of my dear friends here is a psychiatrist and he's a believer and he loves trying to figure out what we can learn and how we can pair drugs to help people out to get to a real healthy, sustainable life in Christ. And it's, drugs aren't always the answer. We, we overcorrect. We just throw drugs at anything. But there's maybe a healthy place that we've got to live in. But here's the cool thing. The church should be a part of that and a part of those discussions. And this is the real cheesy answer. I'm trying to juke all these questions back to my agenda. Is that the church should be a very safe place and well-educated place for people who are mentally ill. People should feel very comfortable with whatever their illness is to be a part of a community like this. And know that they will be loved even if that is very difficult, because if you know different types of mental illnesses, that can be a very, very difficult experience. If you have someone in your family, you know what that's like. But let me tell you something about Jesus. When God showed up in a human body, the one thing that he made very clear is that he loves the most difficult people to love. He reached out to them. So I am thoroughly convinced that they are maybe God's favorites. And, I, and that's not fair, because God is love. There is no such thing as a favorite. It just sounds cool to say it. So, I'm going to backtrack off that, but I think he's crazy. In love. Good question. And we need to learn more and be a great place, safe place for him. Good question. How are we doing? One more. Last question. Make it a doozy. I saw you playing with your hair. Fake me out. Yes. Great question. She asked, uh, Pollyanna, is that your name? Pollyanna. Pollyanna. She asks uh, what I think about it, only humans have souls. <laughs> now this is actually going to get real hippie real quick, and, uh, and I'm okay with that. <clears throat> I don't believe only humans have souls. And you're going to have to forgive me right here. This is the worst way to end this on this question. <laughs> but basically, the, the dissertation that I just wrote for St. Andrews is on basically the, the suffering and problem of pain and evolution in relating to animal pain, dinosaurs eating themselves, how can God live, blah, blah, blah. My point is, I actually think that the Bible is pretty clear in multiple places, like Ecclesiastes 3, that he gave the same breath to man that he gave to animals. It's not a unique gift. He also says in multiple times, it actually mentions animals having a soul in the Jewish scriptures. There's a couple different references. My point is, we're different, though. 
I, I do actually believe that living things have some sort of an essence that is made to be united with God. I think animals will be pulled forward. In fact, C.S. Lewis believed the same thing. Now, I'm telling you, we're getting hippie here, and if you don't agree with that, don't worry about it. You can just erase this from your memory. But, you know, C.S. Lewis and many others have believed that part of the future redeemed kingdom will certainly include life forms that are pulled forward. But the problem is, in our current existence now, there's something different about our soul. We have even what atheistic philosophers would call free moral agency. We, we have something about us. We've already transcended far enough on the spectrum in our way of relating with God that we can truly choose to reject and love. And we're starting to see buds of that in the higher animal life forms. And I do actually believe they have some sort of soulish essence, but I don't know what value that is to us in this day, except maybe that'll pique your interest to learn more about it. And maybe it will help us think differently about animals. As, instead of De Descartes was the most famous of thinking as animals as machines that they do. He, he used to cut open dogs and torture them and laugh at them in public squares to say, look, he looks like he's hurting, but he's actually not as a machine. It's just the cogs of the clock going off. And I'd say, I think we've moved past Descartes. I think he's wrong. I think animals truly suffer. I think animals show signs of altruism. And I think it's a very interesting subject to think about God's relationship to that space of non-human life. But I doubt that's going to make a big impact on your week this week. Here's what I want to do to close our time. Thanks for ending on a really hard one. <laughs> I want, to, I want to focus our Thanksgiving time thinking about nature. By the way, this is exactly what I want. I want to have good conversations about nature, our relationships with that, leading up to next week, which is even more focused on the thankfulness we have for human relationships. Here's the thing I want you to hear very clearly. We are tempted sometimes, and we're taught sometimes, to be thankful for our circumstances, which we should be. But I want to challenge us this month to be thankful for things that are secure, that never change. That's why last week we talked about the life of Christ in the Christian worldview, because it's unchanging. The gospel message of God's unconditional love is not going to change no matter how terrible you did on your test or no matter what happened to you at the nursing home. It doesn't matter in your life spectrum. The circumstances won't change the gospel, nor will they change nature in the universe and our connection to it and the goodness that is inherently in it. And nor will they change, as you will see next week, human relationship at its core. But here's what I want to do as we come to the communion table. The thing that I'm most thankful for about nature goes backwards to last week. This is the thing that blows me away intellectually about Christianity. Is that God, you have to think about God as a philosopher does. He has to be outside of time, outside of space, more powerful than anything else. All powerful, all the omnis, omnipresent, omniscient, he knows everything. This God that's so transcendent became imminent when he entered into nature. And this is a unique worldview for Christianity. That nature itself gave birth to God. He entered into a womb in a gestation process. He cried and pooped and burped and was part of the raw universe that we're a part of. That is Christianity at its core, the incarnation, God with meat on. It is the thing that we need to start to be thankful for and wrap our mind around as we enter into the whole season of celebrating God and His incarnation. And it's actually ultimately what we celebrate at Communion. We're taking these little physical, tangible, real parts of our natural universe, crackers, bread, wine, grape juice. These are physical things, but they're more than that because in some way Christians believe that it's a mysterious connection to remembering that God became tangible and physical. And his body was broken out of love for us. His blood was spilled for the forgiveness of sins. And so as we come to the communion table today, I want to challenge you to be thankful for the natural universe that we live in and all of its complexity and thankful that God entered into that very atomic level of nature because he didn't have to. And that's what we celebrate at the communion table. So we're going to come together and we celebrate the communion table as an uh, open table. Anyone's welcome. Also optional. You don't feel any pressure. You need to. We have four different places here as they come and sing. I want to invite you to ask God for forgiveness as we take Christ into us and think about the thankfulness of God entering our world. Let's pray. God, I am thankful um, for your eminence, your closeness, God. I am thankful that you can be known through looking at the shadow that is nature, God. You can get small glimpses of the transcendent, the beyondness of who you are, God. And remember that you became one of us, God, that you became a baby, that a young boy, a man who lived perfectly, who died on the cross, so that we might know your unbelievable love for us and receive it. 
you rose again because you can't be killed. And God, we thank you for that promise of new life and restoration and the goodness of creation as part of the Christian story. And Father, we come to you now in our individual hearts as a family, and we ask you, will you please forgive us of our sins? God, remove them as far as the east is from the west, as your prophet said. Make us white as snow. And God, we